Jordan was the rare athlete who actually qualifies as a superhero. So that 16-footer he hit to win the 1982 national title for North Carolina was really his radioactive spider moment. An unstoppable force was born. Yeah, but what if the freshman missed the shot? If he misses that shot and Georgetown wins that championship, you can cue up the Georgetown dynasty. Maybe the local kid down the street named Grant Hill decides to go to Georgetown. If that happens, you have Allen Iverson and Grant Hill on the same Georgetown team. Jordan is shaken to his core. He goes and says, screw this, I want to play baseball. My first big winner is Nike, and I think it has to be said. They have made billions because of Michael Jordan and those damn shoes. Michael Jordan might be calling you very, very soon when he hears this one. You know how Mike is. He's going to call me and say, and I took that personally. That's a butterfly effect for real. Look, it's a simple fact. Everyone loves a good superhero origin story, like Superman leaving Krypton or Peter Parker bitten by a radioactive spider. Michael Jordan shot to beat Georgetown. All classics. Kevin, I am with you there. Jordan was the rare athlete who actually qualifies as a superhero. Just ask the Jazz. You couldn't beat him no matter how hard you tried, even if he had the flu. And that shot, his freshman year, was the first time the world saw him on that stage. That 16-footer he hit to win the 1982 national title for North Carolina was really his radioactive spider moment. An unstoppable force was born. It was also when that freshman, Mike Jordan, became... Michael Jordan. Yeah, but what if the freshman missed the shot? Does the GOAT, the greatest of all time, turn into a GOAT and the reason North Carolina didn't get their championship? The bigger question is, does Jordan even stick with basketball or does he go to his preferred sport, baseball? Well, we saw how that worked out later, but maybe it would change then. Mm, yeah. And then is Dean Smith tagged as someone who can't win the big one and then gets fired? That's interesting. And how about how Michael Jordan opened the door for The Rock to conquer Hollywood? You do this to me every week. I'm all in now. Let's go. From Wondery, I'm Kevin Frazier. And I'm Trey Wingo. And this is Alternate Routes. That's the butterfly effect for real. Yeah, nothing left to say. I gotta make it happen. What you about to see next is a chain reaction. Yeah, like, Shoulda, coulda, woulda's never like, see the action. Just keep it real. It's like butterfly effect for real. Here's how the show works. Each week we'll bust open the sliding doors of a different iconic what-if moment in sports. And then we'll follow every ripple effect and play out every woulda, coulda, shoulda scenario you can think of. Now today's big question, what if Michael Jordan missed the game-winning shot in the UNC Georgetown 1982 NCAA title game? For those that don't remember, North Carolina had never won a championship. They had James Worthy on that team, Sam Perkins on that team. They were loaded and it was a freshman, Michael Jordan, who hit the game-winning shot which eventually were the points that mattered because Fred Brown turned the ball over for Georgetown. All right, Trey, you go first. Give me your first alternate route. What if he missed that shot? The first alternate route I would go down is, does the moment get to the kid? Michael Jordan from that shot, Kevin, became impervious to pain or self-doubt. You go through the Last Dance documentary and all he was feeding off was that swagger and fuel and confidence that he was always going to get it done. And it took him a while to get through that in the NBA with the bad boy Pistons and some other teams they couldn't beat in the playoffs. So does that self-doubt begin after that shot? And does Michael Jordan never become the unstoppable force that we knew him to be? He was only 6-12 to from the field in that game before that shot. My first reaction is, would it crumble him? And I know that sounds ridiculous to say now, right? Because we see how it played out, but those things build over time, I did it here. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it to Craig Elo in a playoff game down the stretch for the Cavs. It's just going to happen over and over and over again. All of that started because he had the, the cojones, the big ones, to make that shot as a freshman. And as big as he became, does that moment suddenly become deflating for him? And does Mike Jordan just become Mike Jordan, another dude who eventually played basketball in college and was never heard from again. Listen, Trey, I love that point, and I hear what you're saying, but we all know that Mike became Michael because he rose to the occasion. But if he had missed that shot, I think he would have been okay. That's the same kid who got cut from his high school team at Laney High School. So he would have figured it out. He would have come back even better. And he became one of the greatest players in ACC history and then the greatest player in NBA history because he could figure it out. My first alternate route really is about Georgetown. 
What would have happened if Georgetown had won that championship? It was Perkins or Worthy who was supposed to take that shot. It wasn't Michael Jordan. James Worthy was leading the way with 28 points. If he misses that shot and Georgetown wins that championship, you can queue up the Georgetown dynasty. Oh my God, absolutely, yeah. Forget Duke. It's the Georgetown dynasty. John Thompson came to Georgetown, and when he got to Georgetown, that small Jesuit school that he wasn't even allowed to go to, he wanted to go to Georgetown when he grew up, but they didn't have any African-American players until later in the 60s, so he missed out on that chance, so he goes to Providence College. He ends up coming back to coach after his pro career, and he builds that little college into something special. He had built that team around Patrick Ewing that was on the precipice of winning a national championship. Trey, if he misses that shot and Georgetown wins that national championship, maybe the local kid down the street named Grant Hill decides to go to Georgetown. If that happens, you have Othella Harrington, Allen Iverson, and Grant Hill on the same Georgetown team. Or how about later on, Kenny Anderson, Alonzo Mourning, and Dikembe Mutombo. The pipeline. That Georgetown team, especially in black American circles, was seen as the gold standard. They were cool. They were number one in merchandise. Everybody wanted to be a part of it. And John Thompson took that team and he protected those young men. He wouldn't let them talk to the media. He hired Mary Fenlon as his academic coordinator, who was also an assistant coach, who helped them get their degrees. He really focused on and took care of them. Georgetown was the place to go. So if those other players had come, it's a different team going forward. It's a different team dynasty. Kevin, I completely agree with you. Patrick almost went to North Carolina. He wanted to go to North Carolina, was going to join Michael Jordan as a freshman on that North Carolina team. But when he went down to visit North Carolina, he witnessed a Ku Klux Klan meeting. He was like, I'm not going here. So that's sort of a weird twist in this to begin with. And that's a true story, by the way. So then he goes and he wins as a freshman. Then we're talking about the possibility that this Georgetown team could rip off four straight chips because the next year you know they got bounced in the tournament i think they could have maybe handled north carolina state cozum queen thorough bailey sydney Lode, Derek wittenberg all those guys if they had the swagger of knowing that they had done it the year before so then they go and beat houston in the finals the next year and then they play villanova in the 85 final and maybe one of the greatest upsets in the history of college sports let alone college basketball doesn't exist never happened the drive from those guys to go four for four that changes the whole dynamic hoya paranoia becomes the biggest thing in the world i totally agree with you i think we might years from now still be looking at those four years of georgetown as maybe the greatest four years in college basketball history, and maybe one of those years, they probably run the table and go undefeated. It would have been interesting. My second alternate route goes to the coach, Dean Smith, because let's say Michael doesn't make the shot. Odds are Georgetown probably wins that game, as we just talked about. What does that do for the legacy of Dean Smith? He got to North Carolina in 1961, and this would have been his seventh appearance in the Final Four without a championship. Is that when North Carolina says, hey man, this has been great, but in 21 years, we still don't have a banner to hang at old Carmichael Auditorium, not the Dean Dome, which would probably never exist in this scenario. No, there wouldn't be a Dean Dome. We might be still playing in Carmichael Auditorium. Dean gets fired, and let's take it the next way, because then Duke has an even easier run, perhaps, to dominate the ACC. He never gets another job. UNC can't get on TV. They become a mid-tier basketball program instead of the gold standard, and then replacing him would be a 32-year-old who eventually replaced him named Roy Williams, who was Dean's assistant. This whole thing of Dean Smith being the dean of college coaches in the post-John Wooden era completely goes away. Because remember, he won two championships and all. For all the things that Dean Smith did great, and there were a million of them, he only won two championships, 1982 and 1993. What do those two games have in common? A monumental mistake by the team that he was playing. Fred Brown throws it away for Georgetown in 82. And Chris Weber with the Fab Five calls the timeout he didn't have. It took two really fluky things for Dean Smith to win his two national championships. So if the first fluky thing doesn't happen, I don't think there's a chance in hell this he's around for the second one. And the Dean Smith that is revered and known and just admired on so many levels until his passing and even after he died does not become a thing in any way, shape, or form in the college basketball landscape. Without those national championships, everything changes. He had 
great, great teams. Being a kid who comes from the East Coast and used to get up every Saturday morning to watch on Raycom those great ACC right. battles. Carmichael Auditorium rocking, watching all those great players. Maybe everything does change. And Dean Smith is now seen as, well, he was a great coach, but he wasn't revered. Yeah, he's the guy who couldn't get it done. My next alternate route, it's a deep one. I want you to hang tough and focus in. I'm with you. Michael Jordan misses that shot. Fred Brown doesn't throw the ball away. And so Fred Brown wins a championship and he is whole as a person. He is not crumbled. He doesn't lose all the prestige and everybody only remembers him as Fred Brown, the guy who threw the ball away. Because coming out of high school, Fred Brown was one of the most prized recruits in the country. Even though he won a championship in 84 with John Thompson, when he was drafted by the Atlanta Hawks that year, he turned it down. He went and he started working for Xerox instead of going to the NBA. So I want you just to imagine... Fred Brown goes to the Atlanta Hawks. And when he arrives at the Atlanta Hawks, he becomes a serviceable point guard for them. So the next year, they don't have to draft a point guard because the next draft, they said, we need a point guard. So let's draft this guy, Doc Rivers. He'll be good. Yeah. But they don't draft Doc. Instead, he falls two slots to the Dallas Mavericks. And he goes to Dallas where they have Derek Harper, And they have a guy named Brad Davis, hell of a point guard. So all of a sudden, Doc doesn't have the career that he should have had because Fred Brown worked out in Atlanta. He didn't work out in Dallas. So now he goes into coaching earlier. He becomes an assistant. As Orlando is struggling, when they get swept in the NBA Finals by the Bulls, the year after they beat the Bulls, when Michael came back and it was 45 Michael Jordan, not 23, now they decide to jettison their coach. Brian Hill. They're like, you're gone. We're going to bring in this young guy who they ended up bringing in two years later named Doc Rivers. And Doc Rivers comes for a couple of reasons. One, he helps convince Shaquille O'Neal to stay. And Doc is like, bruh, we're okay. We're going to handle this. We have a hell of a team and you stay and we're going to beat Jordan because if you know one thing about those playoffs, when they lost four straight to the Chicago Bulls, Shaquille O'Neal was unstoppable. They couldn't touch Shaquille O'Neal. They win the next two championships, not Michael Jordan and the Bulls, because Shaq stays and Orlando is whole with Shaq and Penny and the rest of those guys. The landscape completely changes just because Fred Brown is whole. People forget how lean Shaq was those years. People recognize Big Shaq from the Lakers or even Cavalier Shaq or Celtic Shaq. No, when Shaq was in Orlando... He was ripped. Trey, give me your first off the map, your craziest what if. Go there. Take it. Jordan is shaken to his core. So to your point, he goes and says, screw this. I want to play baseball. He tries out for the baseball team, goes on hiatus from basketball. And Jordan probably plays pretty well. Athletic, can run, can hit, hit for range, has speed, can hit for power a little bit. So let's say he's Drafted, weirdly, let's say eighth overall by the then Montreal Expos. Two behind a guy out of Arizona State named Barry Bonds, who would have been in that same draft. He plays for the Expos team, but gets exposed because of that loopy swing we saw when he went to the Birmingham Barons. There's some power, too many strikeouts. But he plays in the Expo system long enough that they respect him. They loved his competitive drive. And they're like, you know what? You'd be a really good manager in a minor league system. And people will only know Michael Jordan as this really, really good minor league manager. Trey, (laughs) that was deep. Michael Jordan might be calling you very, very soon. (laughs) When he hears this one, you know how Mike is. He's going to call me and say, and I took that personally. This is the thing that people need to know about Michael. He claims that he doesn't pay attention to anything. He watches everything. And Michael will bump into Trey somewhere, somehow, one day, on a golf course in Hawaii, and Michael will be like, minor league manager, huh? Huh. Okay, put up your money, big boy. (laughs) Let's gamble. Funny story, I actually did run into Michael. So I just ran into Tiger Woods having lunch with Stuart Scott at the Ritz-Carlton downtown. I was so excited. I was about to call my dad and say, I just met Tiger Woods. The elevator door is open, and I'm running into the elevator, And I run into people, obviously, walking out of the elevator, because that's how it works. People in the elevator come out first, then you get in the elevator. I was such an idiot and so in my head about meeting Tiger Woods, I didn't even think about it. And I run to this large human being that felt like a brick wall, and he looks down at me and says, 
Wingo, watch where you're going. I look up like, oh, sorry, Michael, my bad. So it would not be the first time I literally ran into Michael Jordan. I ran into him in his Wizards days in his final NBA All-Star game. That's Michael. He's a very funny and playful guy. He never forgets anything. I remember in that second run with the Bulls in the 98 championship, we're dying to get an interview with Michael. We can't get an interview with Michael. Outside of his restaurant, his Ferrari pulls up next to our rented car, a little Toyota Tercel. And I'm like, oh my God, that's Michael. And I roll down my window and I'm like, yo, Michael, we need an interview. Come in. And the guy inside there, I can tell he's looking out, but the windows are tinted. And I'm like, no, seriously, Michael, we need you for an interview. And then he rolls down the window just far enough to, I can see his eyes. And he says, Kev, you can't afford me. (laughs) And takes off. And I'm like, oh my God. Next day, Here comes Michael. He walks into our interview room and he says, you got your three minutes. Let's go. That's Michael Jordan. That's who he is. And that's the great thing about him. MJ, the minor league manager, was pretty off the map. But you and I both have one that's really off the map. Take it away, Kevin. Mine is Roy Williams, the insurance salesman and high school basketball coach. Michael Jordan misses that shot. And... Carolina loses in the locker room afterwards. It leaks out that there was this disruption before the game. There was all this chaos that was going on in the North Carolina locker room and then on the bench during the middle of the game because assistant coach Roy Williams didn't get into the arena until after the game started. And what they come to find out is Roy was locked out of the Superdome. Okay, (laughs) so you're like, what happened, Roy? Well, all season long, Roy had carried a Snickers bar with him onto the court because it was good luck. And the only game that they got smoked at home, Roy didn't have a Snickers bar. So before the national championship game, Roy Williams gets to the Superdome and he realizes, oh my God, they don't sell candy in this building. I've got to get this damn Snickers. And Roy never curses. So he would have said, this daggum Snickers, this darn Snickers. So he goes out the door and he tells the guard on his way out, true story, Roy will tell you, that I'm coming right back in. I got to run to a convenience store and get a Snickers. No problem. We'll wait for you, coach. Roy comes back. That guy is gone. And now he can't get in the building. The guy who's standing there is like, ain't no way you're getting in. This is before cell phones. So how are you going to call to say, hey, somebody come get me? So Roy stuck out there. Finally, a supervisor came down and that supervisor eventually let Roy Williams in and he made it to the national championship game. But what if this story leaks out? As this guy cost North Carolina a national championship, they're like, well, he can't be on our staff. So he goes to a small town. He sells insurance, and he's one of the greatest basketball coaches in the history of the state of North Carolina. Roy Williams, the great high school basketball coach and insurance salesman. I love the fact that I've made Michael Jordan a double-A manager, and you have made Roy Williams the greatest high school basketball coach in the history of the state of North Carolina. But I'm going to take it even one step further. And I say this in full respect to you and who you are and how good looking of a human being you are. But Michael Jordan made bald beautiful. And without him making the shot, bald is beautiful doesn't exist. Okay? It worked because Michael Jordan decided F it. I'm not going to go Granville Waiters. Go look up Granville Waiters. He had the ring of hair around the dome. And when Michael was like, screw it, I'm going to shave it all off because he was the baddest dude on the planet, everyone else thought, I'm okay with it. And people like The Rock would not be able to do what he does with his beautiful bald dome today because Michael Jordan was never there to make it cool in the first place. There were a few guys in the NBA who rocked the George Jefferson, without a doubt. And it was heinous. It was not cool. And I remember the first time I heard a woman talk about how sexy Michael was. And I was like, bruh shaved his head. But they're like, oh, he's so beautiful. He's so perfect. They used to do all those beautiful shots of Michael in black and white and just with that bald head glowing. When I was at Sports Center, I was trying to hold on to my hair. They had a key light that used to shine through. So sometimes on Sports Center, where my hair was thinning, it just looked like I didn't have any hair at all. So it looked like I had cut my head and I cut a big block out of my hair sometimes on Sports Center. And then they were like, hey, we're going to put some black stuff under there so, you know, it won't shine through. And I was like, 
Just cut it. Kevin, you'll remember this. Carlos Boozer. Boozer should have gone full Jordan. Remember he tried to have that dye in his hair that one time? It was a line. Sweating it out during the game. Carlos, I love you, man. You should have just gone the Jordan route. Michael, I thank you to this day. I've made a lot of money because of you. Otherwise, I would be rocking a George Jefferson that would make no sense. There's nothing here. There's nothing here right here. So thank you. Trey still has his sexy little hairdo, right? It's holding Hang, on. Hanging on by a thread. Let's take a break. I think we need one. Michael's a minor league manager. Roy <laughs> Williams is selling insurance and bald is beautiful. We had stats and numbers and so many great things. And then it went off the rails. Coming up, we're going to head back to reality and hand down our verdicts on who were the biggest winners and losers from MJ's iconic shop. That's the Welcome back. We just unpacked all the alternate realities, and they were very alternate, of Michael Jordan missing the 1982 title winning shot. Now we're going to go back to the real world because I feel like we have to dial it back, Trey. We went out there. Who were the big winners from Jordan making that shot? We talked about Dean Smith, cemented his legacy, and then went on to get another one. So that was a huge winner. The biggest winner was the NBA. Michael was it, man. Michael became a phenomenon. I was in college still, Michael Jordan's rookie year. And when he was playing for the Bulls, there was a great sportscaster who just retired recently, Dale Hansen. One of the reasons I got into the business, funny, sardonic, hilarious, also really good investigative reporter. He had a countdown on when the Bulls would play every night in his 6 and 11 sportscast. Michael Jordan comes to Dallas in 37 days. And then a week later, Michael Jordan comes to Dallas in 30 days. The NBA was a big winner because Michael Jordan was proven to be a winner his freshman year taking that shot. My first big winner is Nike. And I think it has to be said that they have made billions because of Michael Jordan and those damn shoes. And everybody forgets that the original Air Jordan was banned because of the colors and that the NBA fined Michael Jordan for wearing that shoe. Today, it is fashion. It is, it's transitioned from a basketball shoe to fashion. Before you go any further, one of the greatest lines in the history of television was when the Jordan shoe came out. Jordan's on the David Letterman show. I'm working on the Letterman show as a page. Letterman holds up the shoe and says, now the NBA has a problem with this shoe. Why does the NBA have a problem with this shoe? And Jordan says, because there's no white in it. And then Letterman responds, well, there's none in the NBA anyway. It was one of the greatest little zig zig lines I'd ever heard, and Jordan was a part of it. I digress, but please continue. Michael Jordan has made over $1.3 billion because of those shoes. That means Nike has made billions more. There would be no Nike without Michael Jordan. And without Nike and Michael Jordan, you wonder about where would Tiger Woods be? Yeah. If you remember, when Tiger came out, it's Phil Knight who's walking with him at that final U.S. amateur right behind him before he signed that Nike contract. He's right there, and you're like, is that Darth Vader, Phil Knight, walking with Tiger Woods right now? That means something big is coming. I think that there's so many things that came from that shot. The biggest is Nike and the windfall of cash that they have seen and Michael Jordan is seen. I'm going to go with the city of Chicago. Chicago now is sort of a wash in championships. The Blackhawks won every other year. The White Sox won in, what, 05 or 06. The Cubs won in 2016. Before Jordan got there, the 85 Bears won, and that was about it, man. There wasn't a lot to go for in Chicago sports. No one was winning in Chicago outside of the 85 Bears. That's why that team has been so revered over the decade. Michael made Chicago relevant. Forget the six championships. He became the most popular athlete in the world, and he was in Chicago. The city of Chicago was placed back on the sports map because Jordan hit that shot, which created the legacy that he continued when he got to the NBA and became a part of six championships. Think about the Chicago sports fans that became big because of this. Oprah Winfrey, Kanye West, Bill Murray, Eddie Vedder, someone you may have heard of, former president Barack Obama. Think about someone like the rapper Common who was a Bulls ball boy. You could go on and on and on down the list. I love that. The other one, obviously, I think is the triangle offense. Tex Winter and Phil Jackson, recently featured in the final scene of Ted Lasso, moving shapes and creating all different triangles all over. But that became the standard for how you want to win in the NBA. But as you know, Kevin... Because this is the way it is in sports. By rule, if there is a winner, there must be a loser. Give me the biggest loser, first of all, that comes to mind, because he made the shot. Anytime anybody mentions this game, there are two things they talk about. Michael Jordan's shot and Fred Brown's turnover. 
At the time, Fred Brown was a revolutionary player. He was a 6'5 point guard. That didn't happen back then. If you were 6'5, there's a good chance you could play power forward in college basketball. Not everybody knows how to make an entry pass. Fred Brown knew how to make an entry pass, and because of that, Patrick Ewing was the force that he was. So much of his life now has been encompassed in that one moment, in that one mistake. The kid did not go into the NBA draft, even though he was drafted, because he was just too beat up and he was just too worn out. And he says, even to this day, when he goes out now, people see him, he sees the whispers, he sees the points, because they remember one moment. And I think he's the biggest loser because of that. I'm going to say another loser is a whole generation of contemporaries in the NBA. Carl Malone, Charles Barkley, Patrick Ewing, Sean Kemp, John Stockton, Clyde Drexler. There's a reason none of these guys got rings. It's because of Michael Jordan. It's why if you're a quarterback in the AFC right now, you're in a really bad place because 15, Patrick Mahomes is showing up every year and he's going to take what you want, whether you're Joe Burrow or you're Josh Allen or you're Lamar Jackson. He's taking all those rings. Already got three. They're going for a three-peat. This is literally the same thing that played out in the NBA. And that's a reason why Gary Payton and Carl Malone were on that Laker team all those years later because they were trying to chase the one thing that they couldn't get because Michael Jeffrey Jordan was undeniable. And it all goes back to me from the confidence that he got as a freshman making that shot. A whole generation of NBA players are looking at all their accolades and all their awards and their MVPs and their leading points or leading assist guys and there's one thing missing from their trophy cases. It's a ring and the Larry O'Brien trophy because Michael Jeffrey Jordan took them all. I agree with you on that. And I'm going to tell you this. Another loser in this, and people are going to say, how are you figuring out he was a loser if he won, is James Worthy. He was the most outstanding player of that Final Four. He was 13 for 17 in that game and had 28 points. They had no answers for James Worthy. He was the unstoppable force. And I think people have cheated his legacy of what he did in that game and also what he meant in the NBA. That He was already big game James when he was in college. He carried Carolina along with Sam Perkins. Jordan hadn't blossomed yet into the superstar because he was playing next to a superstar and a really good guy in Sam Perkins his entire career. Even though James Worthy made the Hall of Fame, I think that we forget how great of a college player and a pro player he was and what he meant to the Lakers and how many times... He saved the Lakers' ass, and we never rank him when we rank those top Lakers. And if you ask Patrick Ewing who was lighting his ass up that game, he'll tell you, James Worthy. And you know who was supposed to take that last shot? Sam Perkins or James Worthy, not Michael Jordan. And Buzz Peterson even has said, Michael Jordan's roommate, has said, when Michael caught the ball and he started to pull up, they were all like, oh, no. Why is he taking that shot? Why isn't he driving to the basket? What the hell is he doing? It was smooth as butter. Michael hit it, but Buzz Peterson was like, I don't know what he's doing. (laughs) No, no, no. Good job. Good job. Good job. I don't want this to sound disrespectful to Michael because Michael Jordan, hands down, is the greatest player in the history of the NBA. But I just hate that so much of that moment is stolen from James because he played his butt off. A big part of the reason the Lakers were that first team to repeat after all those years of nobody doing it in the NBA. Those are the biggest winners and losers because of what happened. But what, Kevin, would we have missed if Jordan had missed the shot? The first thing we would have missed if he had missed that shot is, I hate when I agree with you so much on something, but we would have missed the crowning of Dean Smith, as we had said. Look at the picture of Dean and John hugging afterwards, and Dean can barely contain himself. Everything that just came off his shoulders, the weight of the world, because he won that national title. What else would he have missed, Trey? Air Jordans, man. He hasn't played in forever. It's still a thing. Trey, they're not even basketball shoes anymore. It's fashion. My last few years at ESPN, I was like, screw it. I'm not wearing dress shoes anymore. And I started wearing sneakers with suits. I hope to never wear dress shoes again. And I have Michael Jordan and Air Jordan to thank for it. I also like the little moment. We would have missed one of the greatest gifs of all time, the Michael Jordan shrug. I'm thankful that that exists in the current social media stratosphere that we find ourselves in. Now that we are sort of in this headspace and we followed the alternate route through all this time, we've done the winners and losers. 
What's the one question you have left about the story we still can't answer had it gone a different way? The one question that I have left that we can't answer is, Fred Brown, what did he really see? He says he just saw a flash out of the side of his eyes as Worthy ran down the court. And Worthy was shocked. You see Worthy's face. He's like, oh my God, he just threw me the ball. That's my biggest question. What did he see? Is that the greatest shot in the history of college basketball? No, it's not. You don't think so? It's not. All right, what do you got? It is not the greatest shot. Christian Leitner's shot is That's fair. pretty doggone close up there. And I also say that you have to think about Lorenzo Charles' dunk. Michael's shot, I think it's been enhanced because of who he became. It wasn't just that shot. It's who he became. You're right, because clearly there were more dramatic shots in NCAA history. My thought process was because of what happened, does that become one of the most, if not the most important shot in college basketball? I asked the question incorrectly, so putting it in that context <laughs> makes a lot more sense. Think back to Scotty Thurman and the Arkansas Razorbacks and the jumper he hit. How about the shot for Villanova to win a national championship? The second Villanova championship changed college basketball in the East for a while. And you don't have Brunson and the Knicks and all those things if you don't have that. Absolutely. My heart still breaks over that Christian Leitner shot. Damn, damn, damn him. Potentially another episode. I have to exercise some demons, man. That one is stuck in my craw. Kevin, I'm here for your therapy. I'm pleased with how we aired out Michael Jordan's title winning shot of this episode. I guess we could call it the ultimate mic drop. Or I regret saying that immediately. For everyone Did listening you just, <laughs> or watching on YouTube, just let us know what we've missed in case you want to get in touch with us. I'm at Wingos on Twitter, and he's at Kevin Frazier. I'm nervous about when Michael hears this. But anyway, send us all the biggest, wildest, and most agonizing sports what-if questions that you'd like for us to cover on the show, and we'll throw them into the Alternate Routes machine for a future episode. We'll see you down the road on Alternate Routes. That's the butterfly Say I gotta make it happen. What you about to see next is a chain reaction. Shoulda, coulda, woulda, never see the action. Just keep it real.